Okay. The Committee on House Administration will come to order. Uh, we have uh, a number of members present uh, and we will be joined by several others as this hearing proceeds. Uh, as we begin, I want to note we're holding this hearing in compliance with the regulations for remote committee proceedings pursuant to House Resolution 8. We ask committee members and witnesses to keep their microphones muted when they are not speaking to limit background noise and members will need uh, to unmute themselves when seeking recognition or when recognized for their five minutes. Witnesses will also need to unmute themselves when recognized for their five minutes or when answering a question. Members and witnesses, uh, please keep your cameras on at all times, even if you need to step away for a moment, please don't uh, leave the meeting or turn your camera off. I'd also like to remind members that the regulations governing remote proceedings require that we cannot participate in more than one committee proceeding at the same time. At this time, with unanimous consent, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point, and all members will have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and have any written statements be made part of the, rear, uh, the record and without objection that is ordered. Our hearing today will examine the broad constitutional authority provided to Congress to regulate federal elections under Article 1, Section 4, Clause 1 of the, United, uh, the U.S. Constitution known as the Elections Clause. The clause reads as follows, quote, times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof, semicolon. But the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations except as to, the, as to the places of choosing senators. The text is clear, it prescribes a duty uh, to states to make regulations for the time, place, and manner of congressional elections, but critically also provides Congress with a superseding power to make or alter such regulations at any time. During the Constitutional Convention and state ratification debates, the framers fought for the inclusion of the Elections Clause and the broad powers that it confers to Congress. For its supporters, the clause was necessary for self-preservation of the federal government in the face of potential state obs uh, obstructions to congressional elections. In defense of the elections clause, Alexander Hamilton wrote in Federalist 59 that, quote, its propriety rests upon the evidence of this plain proposition, that every government ought to contain in itself the means of its own preservation. The framers raised other concerns as well to defend the inclusion of the elections clause in the Constitution and the federal, federal oversight over congressional elections that it would authorize. They warned about the potential for state, legisla uh, state lawmakers to abuse their powers and pass election regulations that would lead to unequal representation, such as partisan gerrymandering. They also warned about other forms of voter suppression in federal elections that would go unchecked unless Congress was empowered with the remedy of the elections clause to act. The framers' warning ring true today. Since the Supreme Court's 2013 Shelby County versus Holder decision, state legislatures around the country have passed a wave of voter suppression efforts, including strict voter ID laws, improper voter purges, and increasingly limited opportunities to access the ballot. And this pattern has only further escalated since the 2020 general election. Partisan gerrymandering by incumbent political parties, both parties, remains an ongoing obstacle to equal voting rights across various states. In our hearing today, we'll hear more about what the framers intended when they drafted and included the elections clause in our Constitution. Likewise, the Supreme Court has been consistent in construing the elections clause as providing, quote, paramount, unquote, powers to Congress to enact federal election regulations that preempt state regulations and has interpreted such powers to be broad and expansive. For example, in Smiley v. Holm in 1932, the Supreme Court said, these comprehensive words embrace authority to provide a complete code for congressional elections, which was not limited to just times and places, but to the numerous requirements as to procedure and safeguards, which experience shows are necessary in order to enforce the fundamental right involved. In another case, Arizona versus Intertribal Council of Arizona in 2013, Justice Scalia, a renowned conservative justice, wrote for the court, 
that the National Voter Registration Act's requirement that voters affirm their citizenship preempted Arizona's proof of citizenship requirement. Relying on Smiley versus Home and the understanding that the Elections Clause empowers Congress to preempt state regulations governing the times, places, and manner of holding congressional elections, and that times, places, and manner are comprehensive words. The NVRA is only one example of Congress exercising its Election Clause powers. Congress has long exercised its Election Clause powers to enact legislation covering various types of federal election regulations, from the Apportionment Act of 1842, which eliminated the general ticket system in favor of the congressional district, to modern examples, including the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971 and the Uniformed and Overseas Citizen Absentee Voting Act of 1986, as well as the Help America Vote Act in 2002. Reliance on the election clause as a source of congressional authority has long been supported on a bipartisan basis. Since the House began requiring bill sponsors to identify the constitutional authority for their proposed legislation in recent years, members have cited the election clause as the authority for their legislation more than 230 times. That includes scores of measures introduced by Republican members, many of which would have required steps <clears throat> to take certain uh, steps uh, states take certain steps in how they conduct their elections or prohibited certain activities. In the last Congress, my colleague, Ranking Member Davis, introduced legislation to deny federal election grants to states that permit third-party individuals or groups to return voters' completed ballot to election officials. In doing so, he cited as the sole constitutional authority for his legislation the Elections Clause of the Constitution. But this authority can be used to empower states and citizens to make voting easier, safer, and more secure, <clears throat> while ensuring that suppressive tactics and uh, plans may not be used to limit or deny access to the ballot box. For example, Congress has endeavored to enact new democracy reforms, reforms including H.R. 1, the For the People Act, under its election clause uh, powers, as well as other constitutional provisions. H.R. 1 will help remedy ongoing voter suppression efforts across states, just as the framers intended. Far from a federal takeover elections, it, as claimed by some critics, H.R. 1 typifies an appropriate exercise of congressional authority. This hearing provides a rare opportunity to explore the contours of the elections clause and the sweeping <coughs> constitutional powers that provides Congress to enact a transformational democracy legislation. Like H.R. Like 1, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. And I understand uh, Mr. Davis is on um, uh, assignment uh, today, uh, maybe joining us later, but uh, I believe Mr. Style will be offering uh, his opening statement. So Mr. Style, you are now recognized. Thank you very Thank you. much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Today's hearing is titled The Elections Clause, Constitutional Interpretation and Congressional Exercise. Uh, this is really a hearing that our committee should have had before we had hearings on elections administration, before the drafting and introduction and passage of H.R. 1, and before the drafting and introduction of H.R. 4, last Congress. Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution, clearly gives states the primary role in establishing the, and I quote, the times, places, and manners of holding elections for senators and representatives. Under the Constitution, Congress has a purely secondary role in this space. This is evident from the way it's written. The states are listed first and Congress is listed second. Under H.R. 1 and H.R. 4, Congress is clearly outside these constitutional bounds. These bills prevent any state from establishing the time, place, and manner in which an elections are held by establishing a nationalized election system run by bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. And while we're on the subject of H.R. 4, the Supreme Court ruled this month that states have the power to protect the integrity of their elections through thoughtful, considered legislation, making it easy to vote and hard to cheat. In the case against Arizona, the court upheld the state's power to ban the use of third-party ballot harvesting. Justice Alito's opinion stated, quote, one strong and entirely legitimate state interest is the prevention of fraud. Fraud can affect the outcome in a close election and fraudulent votes dilute the rights of citizens to cast ballots that carry appropriate weight. Fraud can also undermine public confidence in the fairness of elections and the perceived legitimacy 
of announced outcomes, end quote. Public confidence in our elections is something I, as ranking member on the subcommittee on elections, am focused on. And ranking member of the committee, Rodney Davis, is leading the way with his faith in elections project. We've seen this as an issue in North Carolina. The results of congressional that, that congressional race was tossed because of fraud resulting from ballot harvesting. California has had issues as well. We've seen it in Madison, Wisconsin. And despite the well-documented fraud cases, the fraud issues with ballot harvesting, HR1 legalizes this practice nationwide. And according to Democrats, prohibition of ballot harvesting is a state is by is by is a, a, a state of discrimination. Fortunately, the Supreme Court ruled this is not the case. Instead, the court ruled the intent and the totality of the state's voting system matters. Justice Alito noted that merely implementing voting structures intended to bolster voter confidence, such as rules to increase ballot integrity, does not equal discrimination, which is what my Democratic colleagues continue to claim. Not only does the recent Supreme Court ruling invalidate my, my Democratic colleagues' claim, but this committee record has demonstrated this as well. During multiple hearings, my Democratic colleagues have claimed that voter ID is used to suppress votes. However, the data clearly disputes this. Contrary to Democratic claim, voter ID requirements of lowering voter turnout, states with voter ID laws saw record turnout in the 2020 election. And I thought I would take this opportunity during a remote hearing to take everyone on the committee to rural America. While I haven't found a Kinko's, the Vice President of the United States may be very interested to learn that I can confirm folks in rural Wisconsin and rural communities across the United States have running water, have electricity. And I found this new invention that I don't think was there when Vice President Biden first ran for Senate, but is available now here in rural America. And it's called a camera phone. It's amazing. It has a camera and a phone, and it can actually take a photo of an ID and can be submitted electronically. Shocking, I know. Now, it may not have come to San Francisco, so Vice President Kamala Harris may not be as familiar, but I encourage everyone to check out these new camera phones that can be used to provide enhanced integrity in our elections for people voting by mail remotely in rural America. And additionally, the data used by Democratic witnesses is flawed. During a hearing earlier this year, Democratic witness Dr. Nazita Lajvardi stated that minority participation in the 2016 election was less than the 2012 election and claimed this was due to voter suppression. However, she admitted that her, her analysis relied on self-reporting voter information from online, survey, online surveys to reach her conclusion, not a scientific poll, and essentially reverse engineered her desired result. And further, during that committee hearing, I pointed out that her study did not control for the difference in candidacy between Barack Obama and the historically terrible candidacy of Hillary Clinton. While my Democratic colleagues invited, my, invited many college professors to participate in these hearings on HR1 or voter suppression, they invited no election officials who actually have administered elections. Republicans, on the other hand, have invited multiple election administrators, including our witness today, the Kentucky Secretary of State, Michael Adams, and I'm appreciative of you joining us here. And together, these individuals have decades of experience in election administration, and each one of them have or will testify about how bad HR1 is for states. They've repeatedly stressed that mandates throughout HR1 will not work in their jurisdiction. They'd be incredibly costly to implement and could even make elections less secure. In contrast, the only two election officials the majority invited had never actually administered elections prior to testifying. It's my hope that after a thorough review of the committee's record and the recent Supreme Court decision, Democrats will abandon their efforts to circumvent the Constitution and nationalize our elections. It's clear our election system works best when those closest to the people are setting the rules for administering the elections, not unelected bureaucrats in Washington, just as our founding fathers wrote in Article 4, Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution. Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and uh, all other members are invited to submit opening statements for the record. We, are, we have a very distinguished panel to hear from uh, today, and I would like to welcome each of them and thank them for participating. <clears throat> First, we have uh, Professor Jack Rakoff, who is the William Robertson Co. Professor of History 
and American Studies and Professor of Political Science and Law Emeritus at Stanford University, where he's taught since 1980. He is a constitutional historian whose principal areas of research include the origins of the American Revolution and the Constitution, the political practice and theory of James Madison, and the role of historical knowledge in constitutional litigation. He's the author of six books, including Original Meanings, Politics Ideas, uh, and Ideas in the Making of the Constitution, uh, and which won the Pulitzer Prize in History. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and a past president of the Society for the History of the Early American Republic. He obtained his PhD in history from Harvard University and his bachelor's in history from Harrisburg College. Next, we have Vice Dean Franita Tolson, who is Vice Dean for Faculty at the USC Gould School of Law and is a nationally recognized expert in election law. Her scholarship and teaching focus on the areas of election law, constitutional law, legal history and employment <coughs> discrimination, political parties, the elections clause, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the 14th and 15th Amendments. Dean Tolson received her JD from the University of Chicago Law School and clerked for the Honorable Ann Claire Williams of the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit and the Honorable Reuben Castillo of the United States District Court for the Northern District of Illinois. In 2019, her journal, journal article titled The Elections Clause and the Under-Enforcement of Federal Law appeared in the Yale Law uh, Journal Forum, in which she examined the broad powers conferred under the Elections Clause and the underutilization of such powers by Congress and the constitutionality of H.R. 1. This year, Dean Tolson's forthcoming book in in Congress We Trust, Enforcing Voting Rights from the Founding to the Jim Crow Era will be published by the Cambridge University Press. Dean Daniel Tokaji is the Dean of the University of Wisconsin Law School and is a leading authority in the field of elections. His scholarship addresses questions of voting rights, free speech, and democratic inclusion. He has published over 50 law review articles, book chapters, and papers on a broad scope of top topics. Dean Tokaji is the author of Election Law in a Nutshell, a second edition, and co-author of Election Law, Cases and Materials, uh, as well as the new soft money. Previously, the dean served as associate dean for faculty and was a professor of constitutional law at Ohio State's Moritz College of Law, and the dean received his JD from Yale Law School and clerk for the Honorable Stephen Reinhardt of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. He is a former civil rights attorney and has worked on various free speech, racial justice, and voting rights cases. And last but certainly not least is Secretary of State Michael Adams. Uh, Secretary Adams is Kentucky's 86th Secretary of State, sworn into his term on January 6, 2020. Secretary Adams established a private practice in election law in 2007. He served as general counsel uh, to the Republican Governors Association and later expanded his practice representing national political committees, national political figures, and statewide campaign efforts. In 2016, he was appointed to the Kentucky, Kentucky Board of Elections. Previously, he worked on Senator Mitch McConnell's 2002 re-election, was Deputy General Counsel for Governor Ernie Fletcher, and was appointed counsel to the U.S. A Deputy Attorney General in the Bush administration. Uh, Secretary Adams received his JD from Harvard Law School and clerk for Chief U.S. District Judge John Habern. Welcome to all of you. Um, we will hear your verbal testimony for about five minutes. There's a clock on the screen which will help you keep track of the time. When your time is up, we do ask that you please summarize. Your entire statements will be made part of the uh, written record. So let me turn first to Professor Rakoff. It's a, great to see you, and we would certainly welcome your testimony. Thank you very much. First off, I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Lofgren, Ranking Member Davis, and other members of this committee for this opportunity to discuss the origins of the times, places, and manner clause. It's also a spe special pleasure for me to appear before my former student, Congresswoman Scanlon, whose law school recommendation I wrote more years ago than she and I would like to remember. 
The principal concern of my written statement lies with the original intentions of the framers of the Constitution in drafting the Times, Places, and Manner Clause. There are four main conclusions that I wish to present. First, a reconstruction of the drafting of this clause indicates that we should indeed read it expansively. Not only does it give Congress broad authority to correct identifiable defects in the conduct of congressional elections within the states, it also empowers Congress to use its legislative power creatively to draw upon the lessons of experience to design an optimal manner of conducting federal elections. So original form, the clause first appeared at the midpoint of the federal convention, when the Committee of Detail proposed it as a response to the problem of asking what should happen should one or more states default on their obligation to provide for the election of members of Congress. That could occur, for example, if the two houses of the state legislature simply failed to agree on an election law, but it could also occur when a state willfully tried to sabotage national governance. Knowing the prior history of the Articles of Confederation, when the states had often fallen short of fulfilling their federal duties, the framers of the Constitution had legitimate reasons to worry about allowing federal elections to become wholly dependent on the voluntary compliance of the state legislatures. Second, this reading gains additional authority when we examine the most detailed speech on the clause, which James Madison gave on August 9, 1787, the one day the clause was actively debated. That debate occurred when two South Carolina delegates argued that there was no need for any congressional review or alteration of state regulation of federal elections. Madison gave the principal refutation of this motion. Precisely because times, places, and matters were, Madison said, words of great latitude, words of great latitude, he argued they would be subject to quote all the abuses that might be made of this discretionary power. State legislatures, which had their own favorite measures to carry, could well mold the regulations to favor the candidates they wished to succeed. And if there were inequalities in the allocation of seats within the state legislatures, these might also be replicated in the design of congressional districts. All these potential sources of abuse therefore justify congressional oversight and revision. The other framers evidently agreed because the South Carolina motion was rejected without even a roll call. But in the third place, Madison's speech also identified the real problems that the framers faced in designing a system of national political representation. Uh, here's Madison's list of problems. Whether the electors should vote by ballot or viva voce, should assemble at this place or that place, should be divided into districts or all meet at one place, should all vote for all the representatives or all in the district vote for a number out of the district. These and many other points would depend on the legislatures and might materially affect the appointments. I believe it is important for members of this committee to know that there was no precedent in Anglo-American history for the kind of representative system the framers were designing. The American colonies and states, representative seats were routinely assigned to townships and counties when they were legally organized. That principle of community representation would never work in the extensive and expanding American Republic. Congressional districts, as the framers concede them, would be wholly arbitrary political entities that state legislatures would have to create de novo and would likely alter with every, with every decennial census, census. As Madison makes clear, the manner of holding elections embraced everything from the actual method of voting to deciding exactly what kind of constituency was to be represented. Given the novelty of this entire concept, the clause effectively empowers Congress to examine how the system of political representation is working or not working in the clause's own language at any time. Fourth, and finally, when Americans of the revolutionary thought about political representation, there was, however, one maxim that consistently guided their thinking. It was the idea first stated by John Adams in 1776, repeated by others afterwards, including at the Constitutional Convention, that a legislative assembly should be a mirror, miniature portrait or transcript of the larger society. As Adams put it, it should be an equal representation, or in other words, equal interest among the people should have equal interest in it. Of course, their conception of who constituted political society was hardly identifiable with ours. But in their times, this was still a remarkably democratic vision of what a popular government should look like. Their idea of equal interest is not very different from the one person, one vote principle that has guided modern American thinking about representation since the 1960s. It implies that the true goal of democratic politics is equitable inclusion, not overt distortion or exclusion. And the Times, Places, and Manor Clause invites Congress to think boldly about how to attain that end, which is in fact part of the process of forming a more perfect union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. And uh, now I'd like to call on Dean Tolson for her testimony. <laughs> 
Thank you very much um, to uh, Chairperson Lofgren, uh, Ranking Member Davis, um, and distinguished members of the committee. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to appear and speak about the scope of the uh, of congressional power under the Elections Clause of Article 1, Section 4, which is a vast source of power, but has nonetheless been significantly underutilized. Um, under the clause, states, as we know, can set procedural regulations for federal elections, but importantly, Congress can implement quote, a complete code for federal elections, end quote. Um, and this code can supplement or alternatively displace the state regulatory regime, particularly if states have jeopardized the health and vitality of federal elections in some way. Under the clause, Congress can make or alter state law. Congress can also commandeer state law, state officials, and state offices to implement federal law. And in certain circumstances, Congress can regulate voter qualification standards. By invoking a number of constitutional provisions that empower Congress to regulate the time, places, and manner of federal elections, as well as regulate voter qualification standards, H.R. 1 stands on firm constitutional footing because first, provisions similar to those in H.R. 1 have already been validated by Supreme Court case law and by prior congressional practice. And second, Congress's authority to enact federal voting rights legislation is substantially broader when it acts pursuant to the Elections Clause as well as the 14th and 15th Amendments than when proceeding under the latter two amendments alone. Despite the Elections Clause untapped potential, it has not been a source of much federal legislation, which contributes to this perception that H.R. 1 is unprecedented and therefore unconstitutional. It is not. For example, a 1932 Supreme Court decision held that voter registration for federal elections is a manner of regulation under the Elections Clause, a holding that the court reaffirmed as recently as 2013. So H.R. 1's voter registration changes are not constitutionally problematic. In addition, Congress can commandeer state offices and state officials to implement election clause le legislation, as it has in statutes like the National Voter Registration Act, which creates voter registration agencies out of all offices in the state that provide either public assistance or state funded programs. Courts have found these provisions to be constitutional, illustrating that those portions of H.R. 1 that impose additional obligations on state officials with respect to voter registration are also constitutionally sound. Moreover, the Supreme Court, in a 2015 decision, has upheld the use of independent commissions to draw congressional districts, thereby validating H.R. 1's use of these commissions for federal elections. Given these precedents, these provisions of H.R. 1 are arguably constitutional. There will nonetheless be inevitable constitutional objections to provisions of H.R. 1 that touch on voter qualifications, which are usually within the state's domain, and in particular, the fact that H.R. 1 reenfranchises those with felony convictions for purposes of voting in federal elections. However, these concerns are also unfounded. Under the Elections Clause, there are limited circumstances in which Congress can reach voter qualifications, particularly in instances where state regulations discourage or unduly impact voter turnout in federal elections. For example, the Uniform and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act, or UOCAVA, enacted solely pursuant to the Elections Clause, created a uniform federal ballot specifically for use by military personnel and incorporated state voter qualification standards to determine which personnel were entitled to vote. Congress enacted UOCAVA to address an exigency that threatened the health and legitimacy of federal elections, namely the disenfranchisement of a category of military voters overlooked and insufficiently protected by state law. But when the elections clause is coupled with Congress's power under the 14th and 15th Amendments, both of which are also invoked as explicit authority for H.R. 1, then Congress's authority to reach voter quali qualifications is even more indis indisputable, excuse me. H.R. 1 would prohibit states from barring individuals no longer in custody from exercising their fundamental right to vote in federal elections as protected by the 14th and 15th Amendments. As it stands, millions of people, a category that is unsurprisingly disproportionately minority, uh, given the racist uh, uh, status of these laws generally, are disenfranchised for hundreds of different felonies and misdemeanor offenses. As the Supreme Court has recognized, Congress has the power under the Elections Clause to, quote, protect the elections in which its existence depends, and, quote, to protect the citizen in the exercise of rights conferred by the Constitution of the United States, essential to the healthy organization of the government itself, end quote. H.R. 1's felon disenfranchisement provisions serve this exact purpose. As these judicial and statutory precedents establish, most of H.R. 1's provisions do not approach the outer limit of Congress's power under the Elections Clause, which empowers that body to, again, make or alter state law, to commandeer state law, state officials, and state offices, and especially when coupled with Congress's power under the 14th and 15th Amendments to regulate voter qualification standards. Thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss my research. I welcome any questions that you have.
Thank you very much, Dean. Now we'll turn to the other Dean, Dean Tokeji. I'm probably mispronouncing your name. Uh, you'll correct me uh, for your five minutes. Thank you, Madam thank Chairwoman. You. Um, and thank you, Ranking Member Davis, Representative Style from my state, the great state of Wisconsin, and the other honorable members of this committee. My name is Dan Tokaji, and I am the dean at the University of Wisconsin Law School. My primary research is in the area of election law, and I've written on Congress's power under the elections clause before. Um, in a word, one that the U.S. Supreme Court has used repeat 142 years, Congress's power over congressional elections under this clause is paramount. Under the unambiguous text of the elections clause and a long line of Supreme Court precedent, Congress has broad plenary authority over the time, place, and manner of conducting congressional elections. And the most recent explication of this principle was Justice Scalia's opinion for seven justices in Arizona versus Intertribal Council of Arizona back in 2013, where he referred to the broad and comprehensive scope of Congress's election clause power. In the remainder of my testimony, I'll provide some background on what the elections clause means, and in particular, how it has been construed by the Supreme Court. So the elections clause, the text of which Madam Chairwoman read earlier, allows states to prescribe rules for the conduct of congressional elections, but only insofar as Congress declines to preempt state legislative choices, as the court said in Foster versus Love. And as Justice Scalia, Scalia exclaimed in Arizona versus ITCA, this grant of congressional power to Congress was insurance against the possibility that states would try to undermine the union um, by uh, either failing to have procedures for congressional elections or for having ones that were inadequate. As he put it, quoting the Federalist Papers, the state legislatures otherwise could at any moment annihilate it that is the federal government, by neglecting to provide for a choice of a person to administer its affairs. Congress has exercised its broad power to regulate federal elections repeatedly through the 1842 Apportionment Act, the post-Civil War Enforcement Acts of 1870 and 1871, and more recently through the National Voter Registration Act and the Help America Vote Act. I won't go through all of the precedent that supports these and other laws in which Congress has previously exercised its elections clause power, but I will hit a few highlights. The first big case was ex parte Siebold in 1879, uh, a case involved one of the in, involving the Re Reconstruction Era Enforcement Acts, and in that case. The court said that Congress may exercise this power uh, as it sees fit and that, quote, when exercised, the action of Congress, so far as it extends and conflicts with the regulations of the state, necessarily supersedes them. In Smiley versus Holm in 1932, the court went on to say that Congress may provide a complete code for congressional elections if it wishes, which includes registration, supervision of voting, protection of voters, prevention of fraud and corrupt practices, counting of votes, duties of inspectors and canvassers, and making and publishing of election returns. Now, there was a time in the early 20th century where the court said that the elections clause didn't read reach primary elections, but, but that was reversed in the United States versus Classic case in 1941, where the court clarified that indeed the elections clause does allow Congress to reach primaries as well as general elections. That power under the elections clause, is, of course, like any power, isn't unlimited. The court in the US terms limit case says that that power doesn't include the power to dictate election outcomes, to favor or disfavor a class of candidates, or to invade, ev evade important costs. But he is down, we still have 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, um, but, um, but Congress does, as the court clarified in Arizona versus ITCA, have very broad power. And as Justice Scalia explained, this power is broader than under other clauses of the Constitution. There's good reason for treating elections clause legislation differently and more favorably from laws enacted under other constitutional powers because Congress, in, in the elections clause area, Congress isn't acting in a place where the states had pre-existing authority before the Constitution. 
Now, there is a question of where Congress's elections clause power ends and the qualifications clause power begins, which I'm happy to address in my response. But the bottom line is that Supreme Court precedent confirms that the elections clause means what it says, that Congress has the broad power to make or alter rules governing the time, place, and manner of conducting congressional elections. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Dean. And last, we have Secretary of State Michael Adams. Thank you for joining us, Secretary Adams, and you're now recognized for five minutes or so. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Adams, Kentucky Secretary of State. It's an honor to be with you today. I understand the topic of discussion is the elections clause of our Constitution. Any day that Congress spends considering the text and intent of our Constitution is a good day, and I wish you every success. My purpose here is to address policy concerns with Congress increasing Congress's role in elections for Congress. First, some background. I took office last year, and the elections I've supervised as my state's chief election official all took place amid the pandemic. I asked our legislature for and received emergency powers to be shared with our Democratic governor to permit us to implement temporary changes to our election system to ensure public safety, voter access, and election security. We expanded absentee voting, and we established early voting for the first time in Kentucky history. In the days before our June 2020 primary election, Kentucky was singled out in a national campaign of harassment and hate with false accusations of voter suppression. Our phones were clogged with angry callers from Washington, D.C., California, and New York, cursing at us, sometimes threatening violence. This was directed at us by celebrities on Twitter, including a certain member of Congress who now chairs the Senate committee analogous to yours. When the dust settled, however, Kentucky had conducted the most successful election in America at that point in the pandemic, safe, orderly, and with high turnout. Kentuckians knew better how to run an election in Kentucky into the national media or national politicians. The expanded voting reforms and enhanced security measures we implemented proved so successful and so popular that our legislature just made most of them permanent with the votes in both chambers bipartisan and nearly unanimous. Kentucky is the national leader this year in election reform, but we are not alone. Bipartisan legislation expanding voting opportunities has passed in Louisiana and Vermont too. Why was Kentucky able to pass a bipartisan election reform measure, the most significant modernization of our system since 1891, that made it both easier to vote and harder to cheat, that had widespread support across the political divide? Why did Louisiana and Vermont follow suit? Well, because you did not stop us. You allowed democracy to work. There are two lessons here. One, Kentucky knows best what's best for Kentucky. And I would urge you to let Kentucky be Kentucky, let Louisiana be Louisiana and Vermont be Vermont, and respect the laboratories of democracy that lead to innovation in a decentralized election system. Vermont passed mail-in voting that reflects their political culture. In Kentucky, even with expanded absentee voting, and even in a pandemic, most voters last year, including most Democrats, voted in person. That reflects our political culture. The second lesson is that election policy should be made not by a caucus, not by a think tank, but by election administrators who work in a bipartisan fashion. Bipartisanship not only leads to a better product with concerns on both sides accomplished, it also shows voters on both sides that the rules are not being rigged to favor one party over another. I understand the concern many of you have with state legislatures acting in a partisan fashion in passing election legislation. And I would encourage you to avoid doing the same thing yourselves. Do not be victims of a false narrative. I don't agree with every election bill that's been offered by some Republican state legislator, but the reality on the ground is more complicated and far better than what you're hearing about here in this Beltway echo chamber. The desire to accuse red states, especially Southern ones of voter suppression is so strong that media outlets covering Kentucky's achievement are rewriting their own coverage to fit that narrative. On April 8th, CNN reported, Kentucky Governor Bashir signs into law a bipartisan elections bill expanding voting access. On June 30th, CNN reported 17 states have enacted 28 laws, making it harder to vote. 
and included Kentucky in their count. On April 8th, the Washington Post reported, Democratic governor in deep red Kentucky signs a bill to expand voting. On June 21st, the Washington Post included Kentucky in their list of 17 states that allegedly were undermining democracy. The cognitive dissonance is so strong that these outlets don't even accept facts from their own reporting when it contradicts this narrative. Our politics has grown increasingly harsh, even dangerous, the more our big decisions are federalized rather than resolved at the state and local levels. I urge you to respect the diversity of our country and the majesty of our 50 different but well-functioning election systems. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. We now come uh, to the time when members of the committee may ask questions for about five minutes, and I'll turn first to uh, Congressman Raskin, who's also a constitutional law professor. So, uh, Mr. Raskin, you are recognized. And Madam Chair, thank you so much for calling this really important hearing, and thanks to all the witnesses for their testimony. Uh, Dean Takaji, let me start with you. Um, in American history, states have sometimes been in the forefront of expanding and defending the franchise. I know that New Jersey gave women the right to vote at the very beginning of the republic. But at the same time, uh, the states have often been in the forefront of disenfranchising people with like literacy tests, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, other attempts to disenfranchise. So what do you make of the claim we just heard from uh, Secretary Adams that we should just trust the states and let Kentucky be Kentucky and let New York be New York and uh, you know let every state be itself. Is that consistent with how we've actually respected voting rights in our over the last century, for example? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Representative Raskin. And, and there are two important principles here, and, and we have to recognize both of them. States are, of course, laboratories of democracy. It is a great thing about our federalist system that states can experiment as they so often do. And that includes experimenting with election reforms like same day registration, for example, that a number of states have experimented with and have proved quite successful in making it more convenient to vote and increasing turnout. On the other hand, there's a competing principle, which is that uh, in the end, Congress has to have the authority to regulate congressional elections. And that includes regulating to protect the fundamental right to vote, as it has sometimes had to do. Uh, the first noteworthy example of this, or at least one of the first, is are the enforcement acts, which Dean Tolson has written about in her scholarship and has addressed in her testimony in the Reconstruction period. It was absolutely vital for Congress to exercise its authority under the Elections Clause, as well as the 14th and 15th Amendments to the United States, in order to protect the voting rights of newly freed African Americans. And so too, after the um, appalling disenfranchisement of African Americans that took place after Reconstruction and throughout most of the 20th century, it was again necessary for Congress to act in part under its Elections Clause authority to protect the right to vote. So yes, we do want states to be laboratories of democracy. At the same time, Congress has to have the ability to protect the right to vote, particularly in federal elections as the elections clause allows. Thank you for that, uh, Dean Tolson and Professor Rakoff. I wanna go to the, the other point that was raised by um, Secretary Adams about election administrators. Um, so I, I guess there's two parts. One, what do you make of the claim that we should really delegate this decision to election administrators, that they are a better judge of what America needs in terms of voting than, say, the representatives of the people in Congress, in the House and the Senate? I was struck by that, especially uh, when uh, the good witness said, let Kentucky be Kentucky. Um, there's no one more powerful than his U.S. Senator, uh, Mitch McConnell, in all of Congress. I, I don't think he's got to worry about Kentucky's point of view being uh, represented in Congress. But in any event, um, I've noticed there's an attack on election administrators going on. I mean, we saw that in 2020 uh, when Donald Trump uh, 
literally was calling election administrators and telling them to revise their vote totals. Most famously, of course, he called the Secretary of State in Georgia, Brad Raffensperger, and said, just go find me 11,781 votes. That's all I'm looking for. And then after that appalling attempt at election fraud was exposed to the whole world, rather than everybody apologizing for it, running from it and trying to figure out what we do to protect election administrators. Now there's an effort to displace him and run somebody against him so they have a sufficiently sycophantic and subservient uh, Secretary of State in Georgia. It's absolutely amazing to watch that. But what about the idea that these increasingly partisan election officials uh, who are being targeted around the country should be deferred to in terms of the voting rights of the people? And Dean Tolson, start with you and then Professor Rakoff. Okay, thank you so much for that that question, uh, Representative. I do think that uh, I appreciate Secretary Adams' point, but because the states are important laboratories, but sometimes they're actually la laboratories that produce some of the most disenfranchising measures in our history. So if you look at the Mississippi Constitution of 1890, that's a constitution where the state substantially disenfranchised most of the African Americans within the state, and other Southern uh, governments followed suit, um, mimicking Mississippi's efforts. And so, yes, the laboratory point is well taken, but at the same time, states use sometimes use their laboratories for ill. Um, I look at HR1 as a list of best practices, right? So it's a list of things that will um, further a national conception of democracy. To some extent, democracy cannot be a state level conception. We have to have some sense of who we are as a national democracy if we're gonna hold ourselves out as a democracy. And I think HR1 furthers that goal while leaving election administrators sufficient discretion over the election apparatus within the state. Madam Chair, my time's up. Would it be okay if Professor Rakoff just uh, addressed my question? Sure. Uh, I, I don't really have very much to add to the discussion beyond noting that, you know, in the founding years, the whole idea of having a bureaucracy would itself also have been something of, a, you know, something of an innovation. I, I mean, I think the best way to think about this is, uh, you know, from a kind of a quasi-originalist perspective, you know, simply to recognize that, you know, the, the fundamental conflict was, would have, or the fundamental tension would have been seen as one involving two levels of the legislatures. The idea that you would actually have anything like, you know, a secretary of state at the at the state level responsible for uh, uh, elections, very co obviously uh, extremely common today uh, in that period. So uh, you know, the the basic tension that Mattis and others were working about was the idea of you know the political motivations working really at the legislative level more than at the bureaucratic level. Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. We will now turn to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk. I appreciate uh, everyone being a part of this uh, hearing today. Um, first thing before we get into my questions, I think we need to separate the argument that we're having over the constitutionality of uh, Congress's ability to uh, set the times, place, and manner. Um, there, there's really two issues that are being conflated in this argument. The first is uh, the qualification of electors. And, and that is very specific within the Constitution. And our founders and the courts have upheld that the Constitution establishes clearly the qualification of electors. And this is a lot of the argument I'm, I'm hearing in a lot of the court cases have upheld that yes, the federal Congress has the ability through the Constitution establish who the electors can be and the states do not have the ability to assert that because that is set in the constitution has been held, upheld several times. The second aspect of the argument is the times, places, and manner, which our founders said should be taken literally. The British system was very broad when it talked about time, places, and manner. It included electors in that system, but our founders through their uh, debates in the constitution and in the Federalist Papers were very specific on the time, places, and manner. And as it was brought up earlier, yes, Hamilton uh, made the argument that every government ought to, have, ought to contain within itself the means of its own preservation. The reason for this was during the ratification of the Constitution, the Anti-Federalist and those who were opposed to this provision uh, believed that factions or parties, as we would call today, could manipulate election law indefinitely. That was their argument. Hamilton, However, a quote that uh, comes out of the Federalist that I haven't heard quoted here today clarified that after he said every government ought to have, ought to contain within itself the means of its own preservation, 
He argued that the provision was a reasonable compromise that gave Congress default or secondary powers that would be exercised, and here's the quote, whenever extraordinary circumstances might render that interposition necessary to its safety. So what Hamilton is saying is the states have the primary power that Congress only has a secondary or default power. And his, his argument was in case of states setting times, places, and manners to where they would not fulfill the seats for Congress, that they could manipulate, they could hold Congress hostage per se if they didn't. And that was the, that was the secondary argument that they were making. And that that's why Congress has that secondary power, not the primary. Yes, the federal government has a primary on qualification of electors, and this is getting uh, convoluted in the argument here. And so I think we need to separate that. And the Republicans' argument here is not with the qualification of electors. Our argument is that would the states provide or hold the primary responsibility for times, places, and manners? Um, with that, Secretary Adams, as you know, according to Article 1, Section 4, as we've been talking about it, through all of this, the time, places, and manners, as I have laid out, that the states have the primary responsibility for setting that. But even still, many of my colleagues on this committee and others are, are pushing this Article 1, which is a national takeover of elections, which would, in my opinion, circumvent the true intent of our founders and our Constitution. Um, my question is, how would this one-size-fits-all approach impact the election administration across the country, let's say, especially in Kentucky? Look at the, the provisions that would substantially, potentially substantially change how you do elections in Kentucky. Well, thank you, Congressman. Uh, let me give you a, a pretty riveting example. Uh, back in December, as I was drafting my election reform uh, measure for Kentucky, the biggest change of our system, uh, modernization of our system since 1891. We uh, made absentee voting uh, easier. We expanded early voting and so forth. Uh, I had a meeting with a high level official in our state in the ACP. And to my surprise, he told me, Secretary Adams, please don't expand mail-in voting. He said, my community doesn't want that. And that really struck me that you, know, you think of, for example, mail-in voting, which by the way, I'm not here to, uh, support or oppose. It's just, should that be implemented from outside of our state on our state because of what other states like? Look, if Utah wants it, that's great for them. I respect that. But in Kentucky, African-Americans want to vote in person. Democrats want to vote in person. Everybody does. That's our culture. We're, we're just different. That's our tradition. And that's how people feel like they have a voice. And so I think we have to respect that. The best way to do that is to let each state do it their own way. All right. Thank you. I, I see my time has expired. And uh, I'll submit my other questions for the record. Let me just say in response to your, your answer there, we know historically by far in-person voting is the most secure. That's why many people prefer to do that, much more secure than mail-in voting. And that's traditionally, that's where we've seen the largest amount of fraud. That, Madam Chair, I back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield is recognized. Let me thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for convening this very important hearing today, and certainly thank you to the witnesses for, for your testimony. And it's good to see all of my colleagues. I look forward to our return to, to Washington. Uh, Madam Chair, as a law student many, many years ago, as a lawyer, as a, as a trial judge, Supreme Court justice, over the years, I've had many occasions to read and reread and study uh, court opinions and law review articles all about the elections clause. And I come to the same conclusion every time I read it and, and read about it. The elections clause uh, seems to me to be unambiguous. And so I want to begin today by asking each one of our witnesses the very same question. Should Congress choose to pass a regulation affecting federal elections, do you agree or disagree? that such regulation will preempt those passed by a state. And let me go to, uh, to each one of the witnesses. I guess I can go in the same order that you testified. 
uh, I'm just a working historian and I'm a little, little averse to, uh, to offering these kinds of judgments. But yeah, I mean, I, uh, the basic answer I would offer is yes. And I, you know, I, I see no harm in it. Um, it's, I, 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 you know, it's I do. Is it unambiguous in, in your world? Say again? Is it unambiguous? Yes. The elections clause. Yes. yes. All right. The next witness. It's going to um, preempt contrary state laws and it'll um, create new law in some places. Right. So for those states that already have independent commissions, for example, we wouldn't preempt those those laws because it, it requires that for federal elections. But in some cases, if there are um, state laws that conflict then absolutely preempts. Sure. Representative Butterfield, uh, I do agree. It is unambiguous that under the elections clause, Congress has broad plenary power over the time, place, and manner of conducting congressional elections. And you don't have to take my word for it. That's what Justice Scalia wrote in the Arizona versus ITCA opinion reaffirming uh, over a, a, a almost a century and a half of precedent. Yeah, and, and Secretary Adams, before you, before you respond, you, you noted in your testimony uh, that you were testifying today primarily about policy. Uh, in other words, on whether Congress, whether we should pass election legislation. And for the sake of clarity, uh, when it comes to the narrow legal question of whether Congress can pass legislation, and that's what my first question is about, would you agree that the elections clause gives us, Congress, broad and expansive authority to regulate congressional elections, putting aside the policy concerns? Well, I think that's kind of a subjective question with kind of a subjective answer. Clearly, there are certain things Congress could do that would go beyond its authority. Uh, there are guardrails in our constitutional system. We are a system of dual sovereignty, states and, and uh, the Congress. Uh, we've seen that uh, time and time again in Supreme Court decisions. For example, uh, Congress can't require uh, states to do Medicaid. And he, he can't uh, take away their- what, what about mail yeah. voting? Do we have that authority? If I, could, if I could finish my answer, there are limits on what Congress can tell the states to do, how much they can commandeer them, whether they can uh, require them to do certain things in exchange for federal funds. So if you're asking, do I think that you have significant authority? I, I certainly think that you do, but it's not Would a limit. Does that include mail-in voting? Uh, I, I, I can't tell you that I've uh, researched this issue. Perhaps the other scholars have. I don't. You, I don't know you, that you, you do. Or don't. You mentioned a moment ago that African Americans in Kentucky want to vote in person. How did you arrive at that? Well, a couple of things. Uh, one, I was told that by a high-ranking official of the state NAACP, which uh, well, let, 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 let of stock in that. You that poll after poll all across the country is contrary to to that position. Uh, minority groups and all groups uh, want the ability to vote uh, absentee as well as uh, early voting. Uh, let me just move on if I can. My time is running out, Madam Chair. Let's see how much time. 20 seconds. I don't have enough time, Ms. Laughrin, for my final question, so I will yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Stile is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. My, my tour through rural Wisconsin continues. I've not found a Kinko's, but I find more and more people that do have access to camera phones. It's also great to see uh, Dean Tokaji from the University of Wisconsin Law School, uh, my alma mater, as well as everybody else uh, on today. I'd like to direct my first question, if I could, uh, to Secretary of State uh, Michael Adams. Uh, ballot access and methods of voting have been subject to several of our election subcommittee hearings. Uh, some have suggested uh, the importance of providing a mandatory vote by mail, uh, would that actually guarantee an increase in voter turnout in your analysis? Well, well in Kentucky, uh, no, I, I don't think that it would. Uh, in Kentucky, again, our culture is people want to vote in person. Uh, before I took office, we were 98% vote in person, 2% absentee. Uh, and I've, as easy as possible. Uh, but I don't know that it would make much of a difference. I think people really want to vote in person. That's why in Kentucky, for example, I just quadrupled the number of days people get to go vote in person. That's how we choose to vote. Could, could I dig in on it? It seems like their political cultures are different in different states, how people uh, per, per, prefer to vote. Uh, for example, uh, in Kentucky, uh, you may want to cast your ballots uh, in one manner, which may be different 
uh, than Utah or Wisconsin. Uh, can you expound on, on your understanding on that point of how different political cultures exist in different states in the United States? Yeah, and if I could make one overall point today, I'm not here to criticize the components of HR1. I don't agree with many of them, but that's not my argument so much. My argument is I don't want to see a Democratic or Republican national bill change the election rules. I think California and Colorado would be upset if the Republicans did that when they held power. So uh, seats are different. Uh, Utah has a vote by mail system. They're well more Republican than Kentucky is, and they seem to like that. And I don't question that at all. That's 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 super for them. But I don't think in Kentucky we would uh, take that as equally. I think the best way to expand a franchise in Kentucky, what we saw last year, is uh, even though we made uh, absentee voting av uh, available to all people, they didn't want to vote absentee. Uh, they wanted to vote in person, and they still came to vote in person. So the easiest way and actually the most cost efficient way to expand access to the ballot was to expand the number of days people could vote in person. And, and so knowing that our states have different political cultures as well as very significant uh, diversity in our geographic uh, footprints is the best level of governance to encourage everyone to vote, to make it easy to vote and hard to cheat. Is the best level of government to deal with that the state government or the national government? Well, I think you just look at their record, look at what we've accomplished in Kentucky compared to respectfully uh, what the national government has uh, with regard to election administration. I'm really proud of what our states achieved. And we can only do that because you all didn't take over the system. You allowed us to actually have breathing space for Democrats and Republicans to come together around the table and pass something with almost unanimous votes, uh, something that was uh, idealized by Republican Secretary of State and signed into law by Democratic governor. So you're a secretary of state. You're also uh, an elections attorney. Uh, could you walk through your interpretation of the elections clause? You just dive in a little further into your testimony. Yeah, I, I, look, I'll, I'll be first to admit I've never researched that issue on a, in a scholarly fashion. I've never had it pop up in a, a case I've had uh, for uh, any client of mine. So I don't have a whole lot to add in terms of uh, the, the history or the text of that. I think it speaks for itself. I appreciate your testimony here today. Uh, and with that, Madam Chairwoman, uh, from rural America, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Representative Scanlon is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much. Is this coming through okay? I'm, I'm traveling myself. She's in rural Pennsylvania. So yes, you are um, coming through. Okay, thank you, Chairwoman Lofgren. I've, I've been really anxious to to have this discussion about Article 1, Section 4. Um, and of course, I'm pleased to see my former professor, Professor Rakoff, um, who, uh, as he said, we knew each other way back in the day, longer than I care to admit. Um, but it's great to have him on this hearing today because, of course, he is uh, the preeminent national authority on the original meanings of the Constitution. And in fact, he authored a book that won a Pulitzer Prize uh, with that title, uh, original meaning. So I, I guess I'd like to direct my first question to him about the clause that we're talking about here, Article 1, Section 4. We've heard an awful lot about time, place, and manner, but the second half of that um, clause is what gives Congress the power to do something different than the state legislatures uh, choose to do. Can you talk about the drafting of such a clause and and what the second part of it, giving Congress the power, means with respect to the authority that's given to states in the first part. To talk briefly about the drafting, I mean, the clause, clause did not originate in the larger body of the convention. It came out of the work of the Committee of Detail, which you know met between July 26 and August 6, 1787, when the committee took the general resolutions the Constitution had, the convention had adopted at that point, and turned them into the working text of the Constitution. So the idea of uh, of of specific you know, of of thinking more specifically about the conduct of elections originated the committee. It's only it was only discussed uh, on the single day of August 9th, and it was discussed primarily, not solely, but primarily. Uh, because the South Car two South Carolina delegates uh, wanted, you know, said the the clause was superfluous. Uh, we should just trust the states to do what they they did. It's worth noting that South Carolina was a kind of peculiar state or distinctive state in the sense that it had a long tradition of the legis the the colonial the state legislature dominating the politics of its state. Um, but you know, once they made this proposal, you know, four or five other delegates spoke, and they they spoke pretty robustly. 
in, in, in opposition to it. And I think the important point I want to stress, uh, and it is, I think it does involve thinking historically about change over time as much as legally, you know, about, about decisions and, and enactments, is to realize that, you know, this was a deeply experimental process. There was no example of designing the kind of national political system uh, that the framers were creating. Uh, I, in my written statement, I talk a bit about the British practice, which is, you know, two nights for every shire or county, and then give a parliamentary representation on a, on a corporate basis. Uh, but there's no idea of having an expanding uh, electorate of the kind that Americans were bound to have. And there was a lot of genuine uncertainty in the very beginning. Uh, about, you know, were we going to represent the states as, you know, as aggregate constituencies? Pennsylvania voted in Pennsylvania in 1789, you'd vote for the entire state delegation. Would you do it by districts? Would voters in, in, in individual districts vote for representatives from each district in the state? These were all the possibilities. So I, I think the important thing to stress, uh, you know, Congressman Scanlon, uh is that is that there is a, a there was a strong perspective dimension and indeed a kind of experimental dimension to the clause the idea that you would learn more about how the national political system would work on the basis of experience that experience would also include the question of, of whether or not uh issues of discrimination as we think about them now but for which there were there was an 18th century way to think about this the idea that equal interest in society should be equally represented in the legislature. In, in some ways, that's a very modern notion uh, as well. So I think thinking about the, 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 you know, the, the second half of the, or you know, the latter part of the clause in these terms, I think would be really helpful. Uh, it's not just about protecting the states. It's about you know, are there better models of national representation broadly defined that Congress would want to accept? Okay, well, I mean, coming from Pennsylvania, where over the past decade, we've had a number of different um, voter ID laws, gerrymandering, et cetera, with um, a Republican legislature where the House Majority Leader was reported saying that many of these provisions were implemented in order for his party to retain power. That seems to me like the very type of um, conduct that the framers were rightly skeptical of. And as we're hearing about you know, states having certain cultures of voting. We also know that certain communities have cultures of voting. Say, for example, the black community that has a tradition of voting on Sunday after church. And we've recently seen some state legislatures try to undermine that tradition of voting. So um, I, I guess just finally, I was interested in, in what you wrote about Madison and the skepticism of the types of activities they were afraid that state legislatures might undertake, including closing polling places or preferring certain voters over other types of voters. I don't know if we can get an answer to that, but I will yield back because I see my time has reached. The gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, and I recognize the gentlelady from New Mexico for her five minutes. You need to unmute though. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Lofgren and our witnesses for the important discussion on the constitutionality of federal voting laws. Professor Rakoff, you discussed how the founders so eloquently described the need to protect the ability of voters to elect a representative assembly that in John Adams' words was a miniature an exact portrait of the people at large of the country. You discussed how that representation might not be what it is today, but today it is supposed to be every citizen, whether they be Native American, you know, Black, Latino, whatever, right? That they need to be able to elect representatives that reflect them. And our concern is that that's not happening, that the restrictions uh, in terms that are being enacted really are targeted so that certain communities cannot, cannot succeed in getting that beautiful portrait of themselves in Congress. Um, can you explain how the elections clause and its history apply to these present day concerns? Aren't they in some ways, sim this concern is similar, correct? Well, certainly, I mean, it, it, you know, in some ways, I would just assume that, you know, to defer to my two colleagues who've written so much about uh, 
uh, you know, periods, periods of discrimination in the practice of voting. I mean, the phrase we heard earlier was laboratory, the states viewed as laboratories of democracy, but you could say equally well, the states have often served as laboratories of discrimination. I mean, that's the whole history of the Jim Crow era of restrictions on a black electorate once it was created uh, during the time of Reconstruction. The question all of us are actively considering today, particularly in the aftermath of the Shelby County decision, is whether we're seeing, you know, not obviously not a full scale revival uh, on the basis of what happened, you know, the 1890s and, and after 1900, uh, but whether, the, you know, the kinds of laws being enacted at the state level will have that kind of discriminatory effect. I um, mean, Congress, as, as you all know, went to great lengths in, in its periodic reenactments uh, of the Voting Rights Act to, you know, to induce the data uh, that the court now seems fairly anxious to deny. But, I, you know, I think, you know, the, the question, just to, uh, quickly on the history side, I mean, the question of the mirror, it was, it was something that, you know, for both the Federalists and Anti-Federalists actively debated. I mean, if you want to hear the other side of the question, there's there's got a fascinating passage from a guy named Melanchthon Smith from New York, also known as the federal farmer, trying to imagine what an ideal Congress should look like. And his idea was actually, it would be good if it had a kind of middle, what we call a middle class quality, that it's easy for the great to associate. It's easy for people of wealth to kind of get together and decide what they're going to do. Uh, and they're going to intimidate uh, you know, these other characters like be represented. It's very important now in the 18th century. I mean, actually, every member of Congress they should know this, that the ambition of being reelected was not the dominant motive in 18th century politics. You know, the mean term of service in the House of Representatives down to about 1890 was three years. It was three years, meaning that the vast majority of members served serve one term or two. So the whole idea that our politics would be driven, including the whole gerrymandering process, or I say in my written statement, the idea that you know, in the United States, voters don't choose representatives, representatives choose their voters. That idea would have been kind of hard to grasp or accept in the late 18th or 19th century, because by and large, it was thought that most, most representatives would be amateurs. You know, they would come and they would go. You know, mm -hmm. they, would rot they would rotate in office. So there, you know, the, the strength of the enemy, though, is, and I think Madison's a good example of this. I mean, how much of what we're debating about today was actively, in a certain sense, anticipated by Madison, including, to be honest, the distrust of state legislatures. I mean, the whole animus behind the Federalist movement was the belief that state legislatures could not be relied upon to do their federal duty, uh, that they were indeed subject to kind of, you know, to kind of partisan concerns. And, you know, Madison's hope, and maybe he's wrong about this was the idea that, in fact, if you had large electoral districts, you might get less powers in politics. So there's- Thank you, you, know. Thank you Professor. I wanted to get to one, uh, uh, at least one other question. And, and it strikes me that unlike rural Wisconsin, where we heard earlier today that everyone has good access to basic infrastructure, I represent a rural district and many of the rural areas I represent don't have such infrastructure. And in high poverty areas of my rural district, especially in tribal areas, access to fancy phones is actually hard. Uh, but in response to state laws that were hindering Native Americans access to the ballot, HR1 has important provisions for Native Americans voting. It also includes provisions to ensure that states receive HAVA funds so that we have fair and equitable rating. Uh, Professor Tolson, what's your response to those who suggest that these and other provisions in HR1 are unconstitutional? Um, they're not. <laughs> you know, and, and part of it is that, you know, the text mean what it says. And this is something that has come out over the course of, of this hearing. The text is, um, although the states are mentioned first, that's because states get a first crack at setting the times, place, and manner of federal elections. It's not because states are the primary focus of uh, the elections clause. And in fact, if you look at the uh, history as recounted by uh, Professor Rakoff, uh, brilliantly, I might add, you know, consider the fact that there was a, a, a one consideration on the table for the general veto of all state laws uh, by the national government versus a more limited veto in the context of the elections clause. And I think the fact that the general veto was rejected and they accepted the limited veto in the context of the elections clause really does illustrate the distrust that the national government had with respect to state legislatures over this issue. Um, and so in short, the elections clause provides broad authority for all of HR1. Um, and, and let me just make one other point. There's been a lot of talk about political culture, um, but making voting harder is not a political culture, right? Partisan gerrymandering is not a political 
culture, right? So we can respect the ability of states to set uh, time, place, and manner as a first instance, but where states are abusing that authority, Congress has power to step in. Thank you so much. My time has expired. The lady's time has expired, and I see the ranking member, Mr. Davis, has joined us. Uh, Mr. Davis, you are now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. It's great to see the witnesses. Sorry, I haven't been able to be on the entire time, but we've been keeping tabs on the testimony. And of course, we're keeping an eye on Mr. Style. Um, I, I don't want a coup d'etat on the ranking side, uh, but uh, it's great to see everybody. Can't wait to see you all in person again. I want to start my questions with my good friend, Mr. Mr. Adams. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, I, do, uh, I do want to say thank you for coming here today. It was great to see you a few weeks ago in Washington. Uh, as the chief election official for the state of Kentucky, do you believe the federal government should mandate how states and jurisdictions administer elections? Well, I certainly don't have a problem with the Voting Rights Act and some basic provisions, HAVA, uh, the NVRA, there's some good stuff that Congress has done in the past. What I don't want to have is a micromanagement of our election systems because states are just simply different. Uh, that's my first argument. My second argument is with respect to Congress, I think we do a better job at the state level of finding uh, space across the aisle to actually work with each other and get things done. It's a less toxic atmosphere than what you have in Washington. Well, uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy to get a less toxic atmosphere anywhere uh, compared to Washington, D.C. But, you know, you look at the last two election cycles, Mr. Secretary, we saw record midterm turnout in 2018 and record presidential year turnout in 2020. And the Democrats on this committee have not been able to produce a single voter whose vote was suppressed. Of course, even Stacey Abrams has testified before this committee that voter turnout really doesn't matter. So can you explain that one to me? I'm sorry, what was the last part of your question? I said even Stacey Abrams testified before this committee that voter turnout, that it doesn't really matter. So I, I, I'm at a loss. Can you explain how that makes sense when we've had record turnout, have not been able to see, this committee has not been able to put forth a single voter whose vote was suppressed and their leading, their leading voice on voter suppression, Ms. Abrams said that voter turnout doesn't matter. I think it does. Do you? Well, sure. I, I think it does. Uh, I'm really proud that in our election last year, in the midst of a pandemic, we had the highest turnout we ever had. Over 2 million voters voted. Uh, and I, I'm proud of it. I, I took actually some hits uh, from my side of the aisle for some decisions I made uh, to make voting easier. But we did it in a way that protected the security of our elections, its integrity. And we made voting easier. We expanded uh, early voting. Uh, we found that uh, about 7 out of 10 voters, even in a pandemic, preferred to vote in person instead of by absentee. And again, I don't have a problem with absentee voting, but I think we should permit the states to respect the wishes of their constituencies and come up with a model that works best for them. Well, did, did any of these changes you made, like photo ID, impact voter turnout? Well, uh, interestingly, the first uh, law that I got passed was a photo ID uh, to vote law. That was an issue that I ran on, and uh, there were chicken little concerns about the sky falling and so forth, but we actually didn't find that that uh, disenfranchised anybody. We actually had, again, a record turnout notwithstanding that. Now, to be clear, our voter ID law was very humanely drafted. We went, uh, went over backwards to sit down uh, with interest groups on both sides and make sure that we didn't have anything in there that would uh, unduly prevent anyone from voting. Uh, so we were very humane in how we did it. Uh, but the fact is we implemented it in a pandemic even, and we still managed to ensure people got to vote, but we verified who they were first. Well, you, you guys had to work with local election officials on these reforms prior to enactment. And I know you offered vote by mail in 2020. Can you tell us briefly, um, how did you work with the local election officials to get these reforms that many of my colleagues on this committee may think are impossible to implement? And how did your vote by mail process impact in-person voting in Kentucky in 2020? Well, I think it's really important that election administrators be at, at the table, at the center of the table in devising election rules. Uh, these things shouldn't be written up by a caucus or a think tank. They should be uh, done with election administrators at the table. We're less ideological on these things. We're more practical. We actually have to 
engaged in the customer service business, and that's helping people vote. So in our state, we found that Democratic county clerks, urban county clerks didn't like uh, relying on mail-based voting as the primary method. Uh, they found that their constituents preferred voting in person where possible. Obviously, if you have an age or disability, you need to vote absentee. We respect that. We allow for that. It's actually a right in our state constitution. But all of that said, we found that the way that most Democrats wanted to vote, most Republicans wanted to vote was in person. So the question was, how do we achieve that? And to do so, we expanded early voting for the first time in our history. Well, thank you very much to all the witnesses. I ran out of time talking to you, Mr. Secretary, so I didn't get a chance to ask questions of the others. I uh, appreciate the opportunity, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to have to jump off. So thanks again, everyone. General uh, Ranking Member yields back, and I now recognize myself uh, for a few questions. Dean Takaji, uh, it's been alleged that if um, Congress exercises its uh, jurisdiction in the Elections Clause, it would constitute constitutional problems of anti-commandeering, uh, and sp specifically, um, I'm interested in the redistricting provisions and whether the court has really addressed this issue per se, for example, uh, in the Rucho versus yeah. Common Cause uh, case. Can you address that? Yes, thank you for that question. And in fact, in the Rucho decision, uh, which committee members will recall, rejected a constitutional challenge to partisan gerrymandering, the court reaffirmed Congress's broad power to regulate congressional elections, specifically including redistricting. The court referenced favorably the Apportionment Act of 1842, which was the first exercise of Congress's power over the process of drawing congressional districts and, and the congressional representation process, and went on to explain that Congress specifically does have the power to make laws regarding congressional districting. So there wasn't really much question about Congress's power to regulate congressional reapportionment and redistricting before Rucho, but if there ever was, Rucho definitively resolves that. There is simply no doubt that Congress under the Elections Clause has the ultimate power over the rules regarding congressional districting. Well, let me ask you, Professor Rakoff, why were the framers concerned in particular about state lawmakers drawing district lines? I think the best answer really involves reconstructing the you know the political atmosphere of the 1780s. It's you know essentially it is a function of the fact that the first the, our first system of American federalism under the Articles of Confederation allowed Congress to recommend to the states what needed to be done for national purposes. Congress would pass requisitions, resolutions, recommendations. It's basically a system of federalism based upon the voluntary compliance of the states with uh, you know with uh, decisions made by the Continental Congress. It was the criticism of what the Madison would call the vices of that system, the, it's, it's, its recurring tendencies to break down that, uh, that reflect, that in, in, in effect represented a fundamental decision that for the national government to work, it had to be competent uh, to enact, uh, execute and adjudicate its own laws. Now elections represented, you know, kind of more complicated things because you know you're you know you're trying to elect both local, state, and and federal officials. But I think the you know my general argument is the failure of the states, you know, the general failure of the states to fulfill their federal duties uh, was the entire pretext for setting up a, a bicameral national legislature that would act legally. Uh, there's an uh, there's an interesting comparison, you know, which I, I think Congressman Fernandez made between you know the time, place, and manner clause and the ability of Congress by law to override, and you know Madison's pet scheme of giving Congress uh, you know a negative a negative on state laws. In effect, the you know the uh, Article One, Section Four is. Uh, in its own way, a version of Madison's negative on state laws. And I think the point I was trying to make is it, it has both negative and positive connotations. That's to say, you may see, you know, distortions being committed at the state level, you know, including kind of pre-Baker versus Carr 
you know, issues of malapportionment on the one hand, or you may come up with better ideas well, about whether this should be elected, which is what happened in 1842. Let me ask you this. I mean, Madison, as you noted in your testimony, warned uh, at the uh, Constitutional Convention that states might try to manipulate election laws for partisan gain. Do you see any parallels between that worry at that time and <laughs> current events? <laughs> Just randomly? Uh, yeah, obviously I do. I mean, I'm, you know, in this sense, you know, first, as you know, Congresswoman, I'm first and foremost an 18th century guy, but I do read the newspapers fairly regularly. So yeah, there's a, there's this whole slew of legislation out there whose, whose consequences we're, we're wait, you know, we're, we're waiting to see. Uh, if, if you ran this, yeah, I will speak for Madison since I, I spent almost every day thinking about it. If you ran this by Madison, you would not be surprised to see this. It's consistent with his analysis of what was wrong with state politics, or more specifically, why you're more likely to get the wrong kind of factionals at the state level than hopefully you would at, at, would at the national level. It fits within a Madisonian aegis or rubric uh, very, very neatly. I thank you very much. My time has expired and the time of all members has expired. I would just like to note as we close uh, that I have very rarely had concern about uh, local election officials. Our concern has been with partisan legislative bodies that are enacting legislation that governs uh, those actions. Before we conclude uh, with unanimous consent, we will add the following uh, items to the record. Federalist Papers number 59, 60, and 61, the Constitutional Authority st Statement for H.R. 6882, the Constitutional of the 116th Congress, the Constitutional Authority Statement for 3412, H.R. 3412 in the 116th Congress, the Constitutional Authority Statement for H.R. 7905 from the 116th Congress, several law review articles discussing the breadth and scope of the elections clause. And hearing no objection, those materials will be made part of the record. As has been noted, members may have additional questions for each of our witnesses. If so, we will submit them to you in writing, and we request that you would answer them if you're able to. The record will be uh, open for uh, to, to receive the answers to those questions. I want to thank uh, this panel for outstanding testimony today, very enlightening, uh, very smart, a real contribution to our understanding of the Constitution, uh, and we thank you. And without objection, then uh, the Committee on House Administration will stand adjourned. Mm -hmm.